Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Monday edition of the Computer America Show. I've uh, got a great show planned for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking to a gentleman with SysAid uh, Technologies. Uh, they're going to be talking about why or why not uh, upgrading from uh, whatever Windows version you're not to Windows 10. Um, and uh, in hour two, we're going to talk about an amazing little device called the GoTenna that allows you to use your cell phone when there's no cell signal. How does that work? Off the grid. Yet it, you can still use your cell phone to communicate with people. It's an amazing product. And if we have any time left, we'll do computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities. And uh, uh, also a new, two new news tips, bulletin and reviews. And, of course, our Logitech winners. All that coming your up shoe will in go Computer live America. In five seconds. Here we go. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. Ben, it's Monday. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, well, we don't get the cheers and yells you know, when I say that it's Friday. <laughs> See, we get all the applause. But, you know, Monday, it's like, you know, oh, yeah, it's like, ah, oh, it's Monday. Um, but eventually it, Monday we'll get the fanfare. Yes, we will get the bench, get the fanfare. Yes, but anyway, hopefully uh, all of you had a wonderful weekend. Did you do anything stellar or anything of interest, uh, Ben, over the weekend? Mm, over the weekend, not. R oh yeah, well I took finals. Oh, That's stellar. But and how did you do? How did you? How were your finals? Failed every one of them. I walked in and the teacher just spun me around. He just took me by a shirt and threw me out the door. He's like, "Don't even try. Get out of here, kid." <laughs> Jeez. Well. I you think you did well? Yeah, yeah, it went okay. All right, well, good. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> well, like, like no one's gonna make a movie starring, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Robin Williams and Matt Damon based on my story, but well, you know, it, it's a uh, the story of Ben. I could see it, you know. Yeah. Brought to you in living color. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> I think Good Will Hunting pretty much captured what I'm all about. <laughs> Uh, the math genius, yes. Mm, yes. Well, as I said, we, ha we have a really uh, terrific show for you planned. Now, first of all, we're going to have our three Logitech winners we're going to announce uh, during the show. Uh, three Logitech winners. Mm -hmm. We're going to announce their names, uh, probably one or two, uh, you know, most, most of them in the second hour, but we'll, we'll, we will announce them. And, of course, in the uh, first hour, we're going to be talking uh, to an IT uh, uh, customer, community, customer community manager from SysA Technologies talking about Windows 10 and if and when you should and why you should upgrade to uh, that operating system. In the second hour, uh, we're going to be talking about a product called the GoTenna. Uh, this is an amazing little product. It clips onto your cell phone. And get this, it allows you to communicate using your cell phone even when there's no cell phone signal. Huh? How's that possible? So when you're off the grid, literally, you, there's no cell phone tower, you can't get it you can still use your cell phone to talk to people. I'm going to want to hear how that works. That's coming up in hour two of the show. And they say the power of prayer doesn't work. Yeah, could be. You might need it. Uh, if you have a comment or question or suggestion for any of our uh, guests tonight, uh, give us a call. 347-884-8881. I'll get you on and get you through. 347-884-8881. Okay. <clears throat> Email is live, L-I-V-E, at computeramerica.com. You can also go to our home page and click on the uh, button right there that says chat and live video, or it's at or under the pull-down menu. Either one will open up another screen. Um, the On the left-hand side is the IRC chat room. Just put in a nickname. That's the name you'll be known by when you go in there. Uh, you'll have to put in the capture code, which is usually a number or a couple of words that certifies that you are, in fact, a living human being and not a dead one. Uh, click the connect button. And your browser will move you into the Computer America chat room. There's also a button there that says click for IRC clients. That'll take you to our free software page. And uh, right there at the bottom, you can see all the different uh, clients. Basically, that just 
gives you a nicer uh, graphic user interface to the chat room. It makes its own window, colorizes the text, and the, it just it just makes for a nicer presentation. And it, but it's completely optional. But we have it there if you'd like to use it. I use it. I use the Chatzilla. I really like it. And then on the right of that same page is our live Computer America video streaming page. And you can see us right there. You can see myself. You can see Ben. And you usually can see our guests. In the first hour, you're going to be able to see our first hour guests. And, um, and so we invite you to uh, uh, check that as well. Of course, everything after the show is all archived uh, under the archives pull-down menu. You can watch, listen to the show or watch any of our past shows as well. It's all up there. So uh, I think that's how we're getting started. Anything else you want to mention, Ben, before we get uh, invite our first guest on? We talked about the contests and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it's uh, – oh, uh, the Logitech contest ended, d didn't it? So we have – Yes, yes. Right. we're going to announce them. And, of course, already, if you go to the contest page, we've started the new contest. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We've got a new contest. That won't go until uh, – well, that goes through January so of 2015. But, you know, we have it up there. So you can register. We'll talk more about that later on, but let's get to our guest, okay, because he's been waiting right. and we should uh, introduce him. Uh, SysA Technologies is an IT service uh, management and help desk software that integrates all the essential IT tools into one service desk. It's a rich set of features, including a powerful help desk, asset management, and other easy-to-use tools for analyzing and optimizing help desk performance. But we're not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, uh, the gentleman who's here with us is actually the SysAid's customer community manager, and he's here to discuss Windows 10, uh, what sets it apart from Windows 8, and why you should or should not upgrade if you're already using Windows 7. Uh, his name is Michael Sablodnik. Uh Mike is, as I said, SysAid's customer community manager. Mike, welcome into Computer America. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well, uh, Craig. Thank you very much. And uh, I, Ben, I really wanted to hear more about your life story there because uh, a potential movie the opportunity really kind of got me excited for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. We're uh, we're 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 casting right now, and either Shia LaBeouf or uh, you know some of that caliber, but. I we're open. We're open to options. Well, if you're looking for like the friend counterpart, you know, the Ben Affleck portion, I, I right. want to go for that. I'm tall and uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of an idiot, so it works out well sometimes. I see. I see, I'm more, I see uh, Ryan Reynolds playing the role of Ben in this movie. So. No, there you go. See. It, <laughs> All right. We're gonna well, jump fine. down the rule apparently, but you know, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. <laughs> so. Uh... All right. Well, that said, uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, obviously there's so much stuff about Windows 10, you know, and obviously when Microsoft said, well, there's going to be no Windows 9, we're just skipping right on to 10. And um, so in your opinion, what, what, do you, what sets Windows 10 apart from Windows 8 besides, besides skipping a number, obviously? Well, you know, it, it kind of goes along with the whole Windows Vista, Windows debacle that, that was a few years ago where they came out with Windows Vista and nobody liked it. Not many people decided to migrate to it. It got bad reviews. And so they came out with Windows 7 as the version that said, hey, we're finally going to listen to you and put in and make an operating system you want. And it's Microsoft repeating the same pattern again. So they came out with Windows 8, and I understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to bring the touch UI to the forefront, and they were trying to make tablets the center focus, and it, it was a valiant effort. Um, but Windows 10 to me is that once again, okay, we're going to finally stop and listen to our customers and give you an operating system that you really want as opposed to what we think you want. And and did a lot of people just got fired? <laughs> that yeah, year? yeah, they did, and you know, yeah. Balmer's gone, and all that wonderful fun stuff. Now you think the one lesson they would have learned is that you know, give us new features, we love them, but make them optional. Don't force us to use them. Give, give me a little checkbox. Say, would you like to use Touch? Would you like to turn it off? Would you like this? Would you like that? So you can let people try them and then kind of migrate to them other way, but but not force people into it. And I understand that's what Windows 10 is is about. It's going to give people the option to turn some of these things on and off. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. It's the evolution versus revolution approach, which I, I'll be the first one to admit right now. When Windows 8 came out, the first thing I did was go out and buy a Mac. <laughs> because really? every Mac OS is an evolution. It mm -hmm. builds upon it, but it, for the most part, is the same. Okay. And um, that's why with Windows 10, when I downloaded the tech preview and I'm not the type, I mean, I am an, a tech person, so I'll look at things ahead of time, but usually with Microsoft, I won't tend to download it and test it out a lot before, but with Windows 10, I had a premonition of like, you know, I want to see what happens. And um, when I put it on a virtual machine, on my Mac, of course, yeah. um, 
it, it was like, wow, this is what Windows 8 should have been. Uh -huh. It looks starts looking like Windows 7. It's got the desktop, the start the start menu, which of course everybody misses and cried about and everything. And um, it was finally that step of like, okay, I feel like I can go back to Windows now. Now, when you were doing this on on the Mac, were you using Boot Camp or were you using something like uh, um, uh, the uh, 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 Parallels desktop, so you could do it all at the same time? Parallels. Um, yeah. I've got so many Parallels images that I clone I over and test. It's I wonderful. Love I love Parallels. As a matter of fact, we had Parallels on the show about a week and a half or two weeks ago. We had him on, uh, one of the head guy from Parallels. It was the biggest love fest you've ever seen. Yeah, I, I mean, it's wonderful. Every, everyone loves Parallels. It's weird. It is. It's, it's not weird. It's, it allows you to do anything and everything. It, well, yeah. It's, all vir it's virtualization I love because I can be in love with something, but I'm only virtually in love with it, so it's not like I'm committing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it's not that you know. It's not that weird. That's love to you know. It's, it's not love. is not weird. It, what's weird is that you know, just a single product. It seems like it really has just kind of nailed that whole market. So I wish I would have a dating version of this for for Ben, so he could you know sort of parallels. Yes, exactly. You could do it, and it's for women, and then you know, oh, I don't like her. See, just, see, uh, is this another movie about one's <laughs> life? <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence as the girl who you doesn't know, get the guy. You've got, instead of you've got mail, you've got a new virtual image or something. That's right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, all right. So, so basically, so now that you liked it, are you saying you gave up your Mac and going back to Windows? Or are you going to keep your Mac and and still use Windows 10? Could well, you, I, you know, that's one of those things. And I just read in the news that Windows 10 is supposed to come out, I think, this fall. Yeah. So I've I've got roughly nine months or so until I can kind of figure out what I'm going to do, uh, because I do love Mac. Uh, and this is, oh, I'm on my, technically on my second Mac computer, um, yeah. but I've only been a Mac person for a couple of years, and I still have a natural, you know, allure, gravitation towards Windows because it's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is what's going to end up happening is I'll probably put my Mac a little bit to the side and, and use Windows more for, I think, some of my work or even some more gaming. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe in using whatever works for me. So I'll do the Mac, I'll do the Windows. And, what, and Mac, what kind of Mac do you have? you have an iMac? Uh, now I have a MacBook Pro Retina with a nice Retina screen. Very nice. Um, Very. Came, yeah. came from a MacBook Air, which was a workhorse. I loved it, but I ran into problems where I was doing more media and I needed something more powerful. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, so uh, so you're thinking Windows 10 is the operating system that all Windows users have been waiting for. Do you think uh, all those uh, Windows XP holdouts and stuff are going to uh, finally come over to 10? Well, I hope those XP holdouts have already gone to at least seven. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You know, here's a, here's a big secret, XP Holdouts. It's not supported anymore. If you yeah. have bugs, don't call your IT department because it's not supported. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, for the most part, it comes in the question of, okay, the Windows 7 people are probably going to be the ones really going to Windows 10, especially since mainstream support for 7 is supposed to end uh, in January of, uh, in a month. January of 2015. So what do you say to people? So what do you say to people who say, "Hey, I know I love Windows 7. You know, uh, is this Windows 7 going to be really that big of a deal?" I, you know, for the most part, if you love Windows 7, it's still going to get the support for all the security updates. So you're not going to be in danger like XP. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the type of thing with how Microsoft is moving towards the touch, towards with tablet design, that it's a pretty good idea to go ahead and go to Windows 10 because you won't have that big of a changeover. You'll install it, and it does wonderful integration with um, with uh, the Office 365 and the OneDrive, and then we can talk about that later. Um, but it's the type of thing where if you're on 7 and you really don't want to get into the weird UI of Windows 8, but yet you won't want to move on, it's worthwhile. And there's a lot of nice features in it that go beyond just you know staying on the most recent version. Um, multiple desktops, the, the virtual desktop environments that Linux, Unix, Mac have had for several years, Microsoft finally put that in. And this has been a long time coming. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so your recommendation then is that uh, when Windows 10, and you're using Windows 7, uh, upgrade to Windows 10, uh, it looks like it might not even cost that much. It might be you know very inexpensive, maybe even free at this point if they're following uh, uh, Apple's... Uh, model. Yeah, I really hope they do make it free, especially from Windows 7, because uh, then I have a couple computers that will upgrade easier and cheaper. <laughs> um, it, it, it just seems like people aren't really that eager to drop, you know, three, two, three hundred dollars on an operating system these days. Like, no, they'd rather just, you know, kind of sit there. 
uh, it's not the early 2000s anymore. I don't want to spend. Well, I think when I got Windows 7, I got a deal where I paid $100 for an upgrade to Windows 7 Professional. Um, and I thought that was a great deal. And, um, and then I still had some connections to college, so I could still, you know, get Windows 7 for 30, 40 bucks, whatever, which was fantastic. But now, um, in this day and age, people don't want to pay for OSs. You know, Apple's free. Of course, Linux has always been free. Um, I think I think Windows 10 should be Microsoft's apology to consumers for Windows 8, and say we're going to give no, it. Oh, they don't need to apologize. They tried something, it didn't work. But apology, really? That seems a little strange. Yes, apology would be nice. I think an apology. <laughs> I mean, if they really want to show up Apple, they'd apologize. Yeah. <laughs> That was it, because uh, I think there's an apology needed somewhere in there. I mean, for making people go through that, you know, that that hair pulling. Uh, uh. What about bit? Now we're talking about individual. But what about small businesses? How should they handle a transition to Windows 10? You know, that's the type of thing that will depend on the business. So, um, you know, if it's a larger business, a corporation, enterprise, of course, they're going to have to have some kind of strategy for it. Chances are, those companies are probably still on Windows 7. Um, in, th in which case, they'll have to f work with their IT department budget and figure out when are they going to get to Windows 10. What I like about it is the fact that y doing a technology changeover from Windows 7 to even Windows 8 and Windows 10 isn't too big of a deal because the kernel hasn't changed too much. So most apps, most applications are going to be fairly compatible. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, the biggest worry is going to be those leg legacy applications. Um, so something that went, ran fine on Windows XP, you could finagle things, get into Windows 7. If you can get in Windows 7, you're probably going to be okay to Windows 10. Um, but the other part of that outside of compatibility is going to be your user, your users, your customers. So how many people do you have to retrain if you went to Windows 8 compared to Windows 10? Um, Windows 10, yes, yeah, some things are different, but it's not going to be as much of an overhead of having to, to train people, get used to a whole new environment as opposed to going to Windows 8. So from a business perspective, I think the Windows 7 to 10 jump makes sense. Uh, you know, the Windows 8 to 10 is probably one of those things where some, some organizations can skip if they're already on Windows 8. Um, might as well wait till Windows 11 or 12 or wow. who really knows what's going to come out next. Wow. Um, I, I, would, I would think you now maybe 8.1 was sort of a getting people back to the desktop. You know, if you were using, but if you were been Windows, if you're using Windows 8, I, I can you say Windows 8.1, they can wait if they want to. But uh, but there's so many things that uh, Windows 10 is going to bring back to the desktop. That, uh, especially if you're a business, I would think that you would. Uh, well, the thing is, if you're on, if you made the jump to Windows 8 and you already went through the culture shock and, like you said, the hair pulling, you know, do you want to go? back towards that type of desktop feeling. Now, honestly, I don't think many people have made the, the move to Windows 8, at least corporations, yeah. I, I would uh, think, realistically. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think that if there's any hair pulling you know, people uh, have done, I think that it was in vain. I think that they, they just went back and said, well, I can't take this, or, you know, or waited until Windows 8.1 came out and it was more Windows 7-like uh, in its implementation, um, and, and they used it. But the thing, uh, I think if you're using Windows 7 and what 10 comes along, you're just going to be given a whole bunch of nice new features. Sort of like, you know, I think that's a natural evolution of the OS from 7 to 10, skipping on all of what was in between it. I think from 7 to 10 is a nice, you get some new features, things that you, you can use if you want. You don't, you can get the touch screen there. You can use it. You don't have to. Uh, you get your desktop like you have now with Windows 7. So I, I think the natural migration of 7 to 10 is going to be, you know, the least painful, and especially if it's free. Or you know, yeah. no, I think that's well. A lot of companies have like the enterprise licenses and everything, so most of the time um, they can go to upgrade without much of much of a cost. At least the big, like I said, enterprise ones. Yeah. Um, smaller companies, it's going to really depend on how many they have out there and what the end users, customers want. Um, I think most people will benefit from going from seven to ten. Um, you know, Windows 8 to 10 also shouldn't be as big of a transition, mainly because Windows 10 itself is built more of that hybrid sense mm -hmm. with the Metro UI, the, the well, well yeah, the if, touch. If, I had, if my first introduction to Windows was Windows 8, you know, I, I never used Windows, I'm a new user, and then I would say, yeah, okay, then that's fine. But if I've been a longer time user of Windows, and I remember Windows 7 or XP, uh, it, it, the, 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 it's more traumatic, I think, from Windows 7 to Windows 8. For, but but if you if Windows 8 was your first introduction to the operating system, then 
then then fine, you know. And of course, then going from eight to ten for those that category of people, you know, say, oh look, I have all these new features, and it'll just be added to it. So I think it's either way, it's going to go well. At least that's my uh, that would be my opinion. I mean, I, absolutely, I think so too. And uh, Microsoft's really, I think, playing a good card, a good move in the card game, so to speak, of where they're making that hybrid. You can it's supposed to work fine on tablets, supposed to work fine on desktop laptops. Um, so I think they've got a good strategy as far as what they're doing with that one, which is good. All right. Well, so let's address the can. Now, one of the things we have here on Computer America every month is we have our Linux show. Uh, we have our, our monthly Linux show. It's the two hours of the both hours are dedicated to the topic of Linux. We have our Linux expert, uh, uh, Larry Bushy. Although uh, he, this is going to be, he's been with us seven years, and this next December uh, Linux show is the last Linux show for him. And we're bringing back to the arena Marcel Gagné, who was our uh, was our Linux expert from years ago, and he's agreed to uh, to pick up the baton and and start doing our Linux shows again. So I just thought I would make that announcement, and that happened over the holidays, and uh, and so that's happening. But let me say, if you are a fan of Linux and the open source market, you know, open source uh, operating system and that mentality, um, and someone would say to you, why should I ever bother moving back to the Microsoft world? What would be your answer to that question? So moving back to Microsoft Word, there's two big reasons why I would do it. Number one, um, gaming. <laughs> you know, I, I hate to say it, but I like playing computer games, and Microsoft still has the best amount of, of games available. Um, but then also, what I really like about Microsoft, what they're doing, and they're very smart about it, is their uh, cloud services integration with Windows 10. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you've downloaded it yet and tried it out, but one thing I notice is you put in your Hotmail, and it connects your OneDrive. It goes through and sets everything up for you um, with the App Store, which makes it very nice. Now, I've, I've played around with Ubuntu some before, so I know they've got like the App Store available as well. So um, it's getting back into more of that Microsoft compatibility world, the, the gaming world, so to speak. Um, and, you know, getting back into, and I hate to say for the most part, but getting into, get back, getting back to more of a paid so, through support uh, OS, um, where Microsoft itself is pretty easy to work with. It's got the great UI with the tablets. Um, mm -hmm. And also with the, the unification with the Microsoft phone, if you play Xbox, you know, someone was telling me that they had some kids that went right to Windows 8 because they, they all said, oh, look, it looks like I'm on an Xbox right now. Great. All right. Well, let's... Uh, and, and, so you hey, well, and and I've actually heard that too. It's you know if you're used to Windows 8, you know then you're pretty good with an Xbox, and you know that that transition's fine. It's just it's you know not everyone is a 12 year old with a supple and soft multiple mind, and they're they're and, <laughs> and, 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 the maturity of one. <laughs> no, exactly. No, but people get ingrained in them that they need the start button, the browser, the task bar, you know the task bar. They need all that. So it's. Uh, Windows, unfortunately, or uh, you know, maybe fortunately, depending on your outlook, you know, they have to cater to the people who need all that stuff. Well, which is, which is what happened. They try to change too much too soon. Yes. Well, well, let's say if you only play games on Windows, is it worth upgrading? Then uh, let me ask you that, Mike. So if uh, it goes to if you're if you're just using Windows Seven. Uh, and you're playing games. Well, most games right now um, work fine for Windows 7, but with Windows 10, they're supposed to be coming out with DirectX. Oh, I always forget my numbering on the DirectX. I think 12 support. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so in that case, if you want to stay mainstream with, mainstream with the latest hardware and supports of, of APIs and everything, you're going to have to go upgrade anyway. Um, if that's a big deal, it depends to the menu, to the uh, game designers and and developers where if they're going to use the DirectX 12 or not because of course it always takes some time to, to move everything over. Okay, um, uh, that's fair enough. Um, so, uh, and Ben, I guess you concur uh, with Mike that uh, Windows is the ultimate environment for all the, when you're really into gaming? Uh, Windows, I, I mean, you know, if you were a game developer, are you going to make the market that has, you know, 90%? Or the one that has seven percent. Like it, it's it's just a numbers game, and you want to sell your game to as many people as possible. And you know, unless you're a browser game that runs in its own little environment, it's really hard to port the you know to to do that. So normally it's Windows first, and then eventually down the road, if you have success, you say, all right, let's go for Mac, and then you make a Mac port. 
Well, what about it, Steam? What's what's Steam? Steam is a bit different. They, they uh, and, and not everything that Steam has available in their store is available for Macs. But uh, Steam is a digital distribution client where you can actually purchase and, and play games in their environment. And Steam has pretty much every Mac game worth playing available on Mac. But even then, that's still a small portion of what is available for Steam on Windows. Well, okay. Steam, from what I've read, it also has a dedicated like Linux box too. I think so. Yeah. They're they're starting to move beyond just a client, um, but it, it still goes the same. Windows is going to be the environment you want to want to play in. Yep. Okay. So we're, we're then we're all in agreement that uh, uh, when Windows 10 comes out and you're using uh, virtually any version of Windows at this point, uh, when 10 comes out, uh, your recommendation is that they upgrade to it. Yes, except if you're still using Windows 3.1. Um, <laughs> you know, that notepad's pretty powerful. Yeah, uh, yeah no, that's uh, that's not going to work. Uh, but uh, well, it, No, but uh, real quick, it's like games, they... They generally have support. I mean, their games are just like Windows where, yeah, you know, you're still using Windows 7, and we'll support you. We'll back you up. But, I mean, folks, it's been six years, you know, five, six years now. Let's get with the times. And games are the same way. If you have a Windows 7, you know, machine, it'll the game will probably still work. It's just if you're looking four or five years down the road, it, you know, you may run into some trouble. It, it, you don't have to upgrade immediately for games. It's just you kind of want to be. Well, well, as, well, as upgraded as possible. You have to upgrade the computer or just the graphics card. I, I thought m most most of it's the graphics card. I mean, do you need that? Generally, the operating system because they run different things. Well, with the rate new technology comes out, you're upgrading graphics card like every three, four weeks or so. I mean, yeah. you really want to stay on top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, um, of course, when the Windows 10 comes out, it'll have its own. I guess you need to get your own, the, the the proper drivers, or it'll have the proper most of the drivers to support most of the major graphics cards and hardware. Uh, uh, I assume uh, that will be just part of the process. Um, so when but when you get to Windows 10, are, are you think that people gonna need to upgrade their hardware too, or will it be will Windows 10 be more accommodating, Mike? No, I think Windows 10 will be more accommodating. Um, Microsoft, thankfully, and they did this with Windows 7, um, where they came out with a new operating system. They said, you know, we want this to run on the previous generation of hardware, and we want it to be able to run well. And so the idea is they're going to come out with it, and if you've got a Windows 7 computer, Windows 8, you'll put Windows 10 on, and it should actually run more efficient, where um, instead of putting in more graphics and more, you know, bloatware or anything that could could slow it down. They want your computer running faster and more efficient and booting up faster and shutting down quicker. Um, so that way, you know, because at this point in the generation with solid state drives and tablets and iPads and everything else, um, people want instantaneous on off and, and they want their device to function well. Um, and so Microsoft is putting an emphasis on performance. Um, they did that with Windows 7. I they, I have to say, I think they did that with Windows 8 because I didn't really touch Windows 8, <laughs> except just a curse at it um, mm -hmm. while I was setting up for my mother-in-law. Yeah. So, um, you know, and Microsoft's going to at least keep with that as well with Windows 10. So Microsoft's underlying uh, uh, mission, if you will, is to make things leaner, meaner, uh, faster, uh, yet keep the richness of the experience uh, in place of that which is is considered to be Windows. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you think they're going to accomplish that with Windows 10? I think they will. If they're following the pattern of the Windows Vista, then Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, uh, I think they'll it will for the most part. Uh, and do you think Microsoft has learned its lesson? <laughs> Do you think when Windows 11 comes out in 12, are we going to have to go through all this again? You know, skipping a version or? Uh, no, I think they're going to stick the pattern that works for them. Yeah. Um, we so, tried it twice and it didn't work, guys. So let, I think we tried it with this and it didn't work. We tried it with eight didn't work. I think now we. You know, I, yeah. I'd even argue that they did it three times with you know Windows ME. You know, Windows yes. 2000 wasn't exactly great, but XP did pretty well. Yeah, well, I just called Windows ME Windows 98 Second Edition Second Edition. <laughs> You know, well, maybe maybe it it was a painful learning process, but maybe uh, uh, we as the consumers won't have to uh, uh, 
suffer that anymore from moving forward from 10. Um, when we come back, uh, we're going to be talking about um, uh, uh, the current Windows 8 tablet users. Will they benefit with an upgrade? And we're going to talk a little bit about OneDrive, and uh, we're going to uh, do that. Also, I think when we come back, uh, we'll call off, Ben, we'll call off our first uh, Logitech winner. And uh, we'll and we'll say the last two for the next hour, uh, if you're agreeable with that. Okay, you're listening to the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, on the Boost Radio Network, on the IRN Radio Network. Uh, our guest uh, this hour is Michael Sobladnik. Uh He's SysAid's Customer Community Manager. We're talking about the world of Windows 10 and should you and will you upgrade. Uh, 347-884-8881 is the number to get you on and get you through. we got a brand new News Tips Bulletin Review from Marty Winston coming up as well. Stay with us. Hey, everyone. Have you heard about the no-no hair removal device that's sweeping the globe? If you want to go weeks without shaving and get smooth, professional, quality results, here's our favorite host, Cheryl, for no-no hair removal. Thanks. Hey, gals. I love talking about my no-no. It's this cute little hair removal system that you can take with you and use almost anywhere at home or on the road. No more expensive in-office treatments, painful waxing, and no more wasting your valuable time. Got unwanted facial hair? No-no has patented Thermacon technology that works on all hair and skin colors. So it's perfect for using on all body parts. And now you can take advantage of this incredible risk-free trial. Get the no-no, the facial kit, a travel case, and a $100 discount shopping card. And you don't risk a penny to try it. Try the incredible no-no hair completely risk-free. Call 1-800-953-5415. That's 800-953-5415. 800-953-5415. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule, your company's getting ready for its IPO, and you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Hello again, this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America, this time the Abbey Business Card Reader for Android. Now, we have never seen a lot. We have never seen a business card reader that doesn't cost us more time to correct its OCR misreads than it would have taken to type in all of the data in the first place, at least in part because there's no standardization for business cards. The PR agency for Abby wanted us to take a look at the new Abby BCR business card reader for Android. We let them know our misgivings about the category. They were confident performance and accuracy have much improved and if that proved true, we're eager to enjoy the convenience of that speedier info ingestion. The results, alas, were true to our experience alas? than to their assertions. Typing remains faster, more accurate, and less in need of proofreading scrutiny than the automation. Bottom line, Abby OCR for Android, their OCR business card reader, is a nice try. And we wish their developers luck in huh. someday turning their PR agency's portrayals into reality. <laughs> this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bullet Review for Computer America. Oh, that's unfortunate. It's hard on them. Oh. Well, I, it's, you know, you have one claim to fame and you kind of come short. What are you going to do? Well, uh, Abby's been around for a long time, but, you know, Marty calls him like, a, like he sees them, and that's one of the reasons why we like him, you know, on the program, uh, in these reviews. Oh, yeah. Well, there it is. Not not everything needs to be a fluff piece. So, nope. um, yeah. So welcome back to the Computer America show. Uh, before we get back to Mike, and uh, 
we should announce, because over the weekend we did close our Logitech contest, yes. uh, we should announce our first, or uh, our first, but rather our third place winner in that contest. Yeah, we should. And by the way, just as we mentioned, uh, the contest is up and running again. So if you go to our Logitech contest, uh, our contest page, you can see we've opened it up again. And, uh, and uh, um, it is running as we speak. So let's do our third place winner, and this is for the Logitech HD Webcam C310, valued at fifty dollars. Okay, fifty bucks. Uh, really nice webcam, uh, high definition uh, video, and that winner is. Patricia Shadden. Congratulations, Patricia. She's a third place winner, the Logitech HT Webcam C310. Now, Patricia listens to us in Hayward, California. Cool. Hayward, California. And, uh, and um, so she uh, wins that prize, and congratulations to you. Uh, Patricia, you are a third place winner. We've got two more announcing uh, to announce coming up later on the show. But uh, let's get back. You did mention that a stipulation of the contest is if we ever come through town, you must put us up for at least two nights, right? Yeah. Yes, that and put us on Breakfast the list. Breakfast for only one, but two nights minimum. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Just, just want to make sure everyone understands that about You're this contest. Kidding. You don't have to do that. <laughs> You're kidding. Yeah, Craig's <laughs> kidding. Uh, so anyhow, uh, we are talking with uh, uh, Mike Olsavladnik. Mike is SysAid's customer community manager. Mike, can you unmute your mic? And there you go. And uh, he is. Uh, so we're talking about Windows 10, and uh, we've covered a, a lot of the uh, different things. Um, how can current Windows 8 tablet users benefit with an upgrade, or would they even benefit with a, an upgrade? Because a tablet is. Not necessarily. Well, you know, I mean, I I know Microsoft makes the uh, uh, their version of the uh, tablet, which is a full version of uh, Surface. Surface, yeah, the, for the Surface Three or the Surface Pro. Uh, um, would they benefit from it? You know, I don't think they'll benefit as much as people from Windows Seven to Windows Ten. Um, you know, because Windows 10 is supposed to have that hybrid UI with it as well. So in theory, and of course Windows 10 really isn't out yet, and I'm only testing in a virtual box and I don't have a nice tablet to try it out with. Um, in theory, going to Windows 10 from Windows 8 should be fairly similar. Um, I think most of the features you're going to get are more under the hood type of things. Um, you know, especially if you dock it and you're using it more of a, as, a, as a laptop instead of a tablet, you'll, you'll get more back to that desktop look. Um, and then also the OneDrive integration that, you know, I, impressed me when I connected everything and, and was very happy about it. Um, but, you know, it's the type of thing where if you're very happy with your Windows 8, 8 one tablet and it's going great for you, um, you know, just go ahead and worry about upgrading whenever you get the chance to do the... the it's supposed to be free upgrade, so I, I don't know if that'll be the case, but... Well, will the tablets have enough horsepower in them to support a full implementation of Windows 10. That's, I guess that's probably my, would be my real question here. You know? you know, I'm not worried about the horsepower. I'm more worried about the storage size. Yeah. Um, because if you've got a 64 gig you know, solid state drive in a tablet, that's really not a lot of space once you have an install of Windows, be it 10 or Windows 8 for that matter. Um, you know, the, as far as the CPU and RAM, I think most, if it runs Windows 8 now, it's probably going to run Windows 10 fine. You don't think you'll need more memory for Windows 10, is what you're saying? No, uh, I don't think you will. I think you'll be good. But do you think Windows 10 will take advantage of more memory, though? Wouldn't it? Oh, it's oh, it's going to take advantage of all the memory it, it can get. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. So, I mean, yeah. this is Microsoft we're talking about. Yeah, this is true. Okay. All right. So you're saying that the that that if the unless they have more, I mean, um, more sophisticated hardware that you might. The window, and you're happy with Windows 8 and the tablet, you might want to keep the Windows 8 uh, environment. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, the rumor is the upgrade... The, now, like I guess that's a rumor. Uh, it's supposed to be free upgrade from Windows 8 to Windows 10, so... You, you know. can try it and see if you like it and not go back. If it's, yeah, you can do a drive image and you can yeah. go back if you don't like it. So you keep mentioning OneDrive all this time, and so... 
So let's let's focus in on that. Uh, how is Microsoft integrating their OneDrive cloud system into this product? So, and I've mentioned it before. What I like is the fact that when you go, if you're a consumer, uh, and you go ahead and set up your Windows 10, you put in your Microsoft login credentials, which connects your OneDrive, and right away it will go ahead and set up the drive for your computer. All your documents will show up. Everything you have, you know, pictures, whatever you have in OneDrive, it will come through and just have on your computer right away. Um, and then also, if you start saving documents to it, it will then go ahead and automatically save to OneDrive, and then you can go through the Office 365 or mobile devices, and then be able to get those files. So. It's Microsoft moving the same direction of Google and the same direction of Apple where they're integrating their cloud services with the desktop. Um, you know, the one big thing with Microsoft, though, is because they already have such a huge footprint, it's got a bigger impact for them where, you know, they have the OneDrive. It, it originally got renamed from the SkyDrive because of the copyright and everything else that was going on with it. Um, so it's, I think, going to be the big push to get people into the cloud uh, if you're a Microsoft user. Okay. Um, and, and it's got also got a lot of space for free as opposed to Apple where you, where you have to pay for, for a lot of the usage. Yeah. Well, how, I mean, well, well, you get five gigs for free, I think, with Apple, with their, with their, uh, with their cloud drive. Yeah, uh, I think it was something like that. I mean, Google has minimum 15, but I think they even increased it from there. Um, but Microsoft is, if you do like an Office subscription, I think they're giving you unlimited space now. You know, we've been down this road with BitCasa. You said, you remember the unlimited storage, you know, and everything? And then, of course, then they retracted everything uh, that they said. Uh, well, of course, that was a small company. They're not Microsoft. Do you think Microsoft is going to say they're going to stick with this unlimited thing? Or is it for, you think it's going to be a limited time? I mean, unlimited you know, is a very slippery word. I mean, especially in the cell phone company. I mean, unlimited oh, yeah. data, unlimited. Un, you it's know, a big oh. number. It's a big number, but then they keep changing it around. They keep reshuffling the deck. What do you think is going to happen? You know, Microsoft is, they already started advertising it, so if it starts costing them money, um, maybe, you know, Bill Gates doesn't give as much to charity that year. I don't know. <laughs> um, but th they're Microsoft. They're going to have to do it, and if they want to stay in business compared to Apple and, and Google especially, Google's the I would think is their bigger competitor at this point. Um, you know they're going to have to do something to just you know well, make them their 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 company distinct. Well, I mean, I mean, come on. Let, I mean, let's say somebody. It always it always takes just one person to abuse it to, to ruin it for everybody else. I, what what if somebody comes and they and they start you know getting up into the petabytes? See, of, you know? he, here's where I think you, uh, Microsoft is differing from everyone else is that Microsoft says okay, you get unlimited cloud storage with Office. Like, they're not saying, okay, yeah, you, you can host your file sharing servers off our servers. No, it, it's, you know, if you have a Word document, PowerPoint, uh, all that kind of thing, you know, yeah, sure, go ahead. Anything Office related, we got it. But I guess, you know, it just takes one person to say, you know, to figure out how to trick the system and say, okay, it looks like a PowerPoint presentation, but really, it's a 32 gig movie that's, you know, a 32 gig Blu-ray movie or something like that. That abuses it. So, I mean, they're in, they're intending it to just be office documents. So, what you're saying is there's a market for a peer-to-peer -peer movie sharing client that <laughs> saves files as PPTX. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay, just wanted. I got. I got to talk to some people. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes is someone to kind of trick the system and, and get them to, um, you know, get other sources of files onto their server because server server space for the you know for, for the little guy for the average guy that costs a bunch and if Microsoft is handing it out for free essentially you know why not do that it, it's but right now they're completely you know they're not trying to be big cost and they're not trying to be anyone that says doesn't matter how much data doesn't matter what it is however much it is go ahead we got gotcha. you it, it's not that at all it's it's more limited so if Kim.com is listening to this he can cut me in for a little percentage of his new idea. Okay, that's all I want to say. Yeah. And also, if Kim got, if Kim dot com was listening, we want you back on the show. Hurry up. <laughs> so, so they're saying Microsoft is saying their unlimited solution is strictly for Office related documents. Is that what they're saying? Uh, as opposed to storing all your videos and all your photos and everything. Uh, Mike, is that what they're saying? Uh, I think for the biggest part, yeah. Where all the Office documents, everything can be stored in the cloud, which you know, for the most part, is a pretty good deal in the sense of 
and and I know I've had this type of issue where I've got constant paranoia of losing my files, mm -hmm. especially work related PowerPoints. Um, I know that they also give some storage for photographs and everything. OneDrive can you know, can just put a client on your phone, upload everything, and so uh, if they can remove some of that paranoia, I'm game for it um, because. Yeah. But is it unlimited photos? I mean, is there, 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 photos aren't a part of Office. Are they a, a, any part of Office? Or, well, you know, uh, maybe well, in the I, I thought they had at least five gigs free for the photos, which is really a lot, honestly. Yeah. Um, I have to go back and look at the fine print for the Office part. And, and the ironic thing is I don't have an Office 365 subscription. Right now I'm using Google Drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, yeah. Uh, I mean, the apps... Are, but you know, and I can understand that. I mean, you get you get all that stuff for free with the with the Google apps. Uh, but but um, when if you are a business or a company and you're using Office, then you need to have that compatibility. And for ninety nine bucks for a year, you know, isn't all that bad? You know, no, up to five computers and yeah. devices, I think. Yeah, I mean that's really not that bad. I mean, considering what Office used to cost four hundred ninety five dollars, and that was what without access. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can't tell you how many times I had to copy that key and. Yeah, but I, but I didn't say that. No, no, you didn't. No, no, oh. no, no, shh. Just between. On, this was this was like Office ninety five or ninety seven, <laughs> or whatever. You, you, you know, before copyright was a thing. Yeah, but yeah, you know, I was underage at the time. Yeah, exactly. They can't press charges. Uh, so, um, so. No, but I I think it's you know the 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 OneDrive with unlimited storage space I think that's only pertaining to office type documents you know which is great because you know you want those things backed up to the cloud you want to be able to access them from anywhere just like the program itself you know you just have your you know your, your login and assuming it's installed on the computer you can get all your stuff yeah, but perfect it, but, it, but they also have like a separate a separate version that gives you five ten gigs whatever it is for anything else you want to store it's not unlimited though yeah but a terabyte of word documents <laughs> That's, that's a lot of work, Doc. <laughs> well, you know, if you ever wanted to transcribe, huh? if you ever wanted to transcribe the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy, that's your business. That's but, still, that's a hundred megs. Yeah, that's a hundred megs at best. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I mean, I can see that. Um, uh, and then even for corporate, you know, uh, uh, a terabyte of word documents is probably more than most even big businesses would you know use, uh, if that. So uh, that that's the whole thing about office documents. They don't really take a lot of room. They take a very very little room. The thing that takes the room, the the the, the storage hogs are the are the are the pictures and uh, the you know the, the the raw version of the pictures. So the, you know each each photo is like 20, 20 megabytes or something like that. Twenty, but uh, or twenty gigabytes. But the um, uh, but the video video is what really is the the hog of uh, of storage. And Microsoft. Is not saying you can store all the videos you want. They're just saying all the Word document, uh, all the uh, Office documents. So that's basically how they're getting around that. Um, and if you want that, then you're going to have to pay for it or subscribe to a service that 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 archives. You can probably use the Microsoft service. I don't know what they get for five gigs, but I'm sure it must be competitive with what's out, what else is out there. Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, so to summarize everything. Uh, Windows 10 basically is a thumbs up, especially if you're using Windows 7 or using Windows or anything earlier than Windows 7. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Windows 10, big thumbs up. You should upgrade it. If you're using Windows 8 or 8.1, if you are a first-time user of Windows and you began with Windows 8 and 8.1, so it really wasn't a trip. You didn't realize, you know, what you were missing. Uh, you you can st you can stay with Windows 8 or 8.1 if you're happy with it, um, or uh, are you advocating? Um, oh, what is it? Obliviousness is what is it? Um, ignorance not, is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Are are you advocating ignorance is bliss right now? <laughs> it's like if you don't if if you didn't know what you were missing, yeah, stick with 8.1. You know why not? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. That's what you're saying. Okay. Okay. No, no. Uh, I, I actually had a question. You know, before we kind of summarize the whole thing, is uh, are there any elements that you know I, you know, if I upgrade, I'm going to be coming from a Windows 7 operating system, and I had very limited hands-on with Windows 8. Are there going to be any elements of Windows 10 that are going to be like, oh, that was in Windows 8? I never knew. Why? You know, uh, what's going? Uh, like, 
I had uh, I heard that live tiles were going to be part of like the start menu and things like that. Like, are there any features from Windows 8 that they're carrying over? So, I mean, there are, and it's when I was working with the Windows 10 virtual environment, I was getting used to some of it where um, they kept the same Windows uh, 8, like Charms Bar, for example. Um, so that's still there, and um, when you go to shut down, it's not the happy go lucky shutdown that it normally is with Windows 7. You still have to go to shutdown and bring up like a different charms menu to get to it. Um, I think they may have just done a different build now where shutdown is part of the start menu. So, you know, it, it, it is still in the technical preview, so it's still changing, and Microsoft will have that little fine print that says, this is not the final. Um, but there are a lot of those elements that are in there, especially the settings, getting into the system settings. Uh, that looks more like Windows 8 as well. Do you think they're going to pull that de debacle they did with the, uh, when you, when you, how was, how did it work? In other words, if you look, if you went for the technical preview of 8 and you accepted it, then, and then you bought the actual version, you lost out on all the different settings. Remember that? It was just really awful. Uh, a lot of people really didn't like that. Uh, and, and you, you know, it was like doing a clean install. You had to start all over again if you wanted to. And if you'd done any work with the technical preview of Windows 8, uh, you were sort of out of luck. Um, do you think that they're going to do that as well with Windows 10 with this technical preview? I think that they will. They're still Microsoft after all, and you know, I, I think they want to basically say, okay, now that we have the release candidate, it's gone gold. If you've got the technical preview, you better reformat and get rid of it. Yeah, and and just reinstall it again. Yeah, which, uh, you know, it. I think they're trying to simplify their license model, so hopefully you won't lose as much. Um, but if not, you know, get a backup image. Yeah, a lot of people were miffed over that. You know, they said you know they they jumped ahead and they got it, and it was you know I think it was free at the time, and then uh, when they wanted to get it, uh, when they actually did the golden release, uh, all of your work basically was lost. You had to either. Well, we we actually had a caller that you know I, I think kind of has something to do with that, where where the. Uh, and I get with settings, you can kind of be picky about it, but with the Windows 10 technical preview, you know, it, it, it does track a lot. So, you know, maybe just as much as they're changing behind the scenes that you can't really see, you know, maybe they're taking out all the, uh, you know, all, all the sending of data, they, you know, it, it'd just be more complicated to keep everyone setting from one version to another. Like, they're definitely different versions from yeah. preview to live. Yeah, okay. All right, well, in this last couple of minutes, uh, uh, Mike, uh, in your opinion, what do you think the next move for Microsoft is? Uh, I don't think it's so much of a move as opposed to just continuation on the strategy they have right now, and that's uh, pushing everyone towards the one OS to rule, rule them all, which no one's really done yet. I mean, not even Apple for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, get everybody on the same UI so that way, hey, if you're playing an Xbox, it will look natural to go over to, to your Windows computer. Um, you know, Microsoft's doing a great thing with their new fitness, uh, what is it, the fitness band that came out, mm. um, where it can work for our iOS, Android, and Microsoft. So, um, you know, I think, I think they're moving in the right direction. Mm. Really? Uh, they, they seem like they're more willing to play nice with others, which, you know, before Windows had the luxury of just, you know, kind of being a man onto itself because, hey, they owned, you know, 100% of the world. But... Nowadays, everyone has an iPhone, everyone has an Android, so why not play nice with others? Yeah. More, Listen, mo more money playing nice. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit what you do at SysA Technologies. You're, you're the customer community manager. What does the customer community manager do? Uh, so our customer community is focused on the SysA forums itself. So if you go to our website, um, uh, sysaid.com, there's a forum section there where we have a pretty, pretty strong community of people who are either working on uh, coming up with new ideas on how to use SysAid, some IT discussions, and so I help with managing it, making sure that everybody uh, gets their questions answered, uh, contributing with new question, uh, new information, company news, things like that. So um, uh, that's just one aspect of it. Uh, because I've also worked in the industry and have some of the uh, accreditation, uh, accreditations and certifications that go along with it, I get to write content and blogs, and uh, for the most part, I have a pretty fun time. Yeah, it sounds like you do. I mean, you don't. Ha you have that bounce in your voice. It's not like you've been doing it. And, oh, yeah, this is kind of it. It's, you know, it's it's wearing down on you. It sounds like it's still new and fresh for you. And uh, and and like, I, I mean, tech support can be uh, can be can really get to you uh, if you if you're not careful. 
It, it can, and uh, SysAid is one of the few companies that I've worked at and have known where uh, they have a pretty fun time. Um, yeah, they have their, you know, it can be tough uh, just like any others, and uh, the particular industry we're in with service desk, help desk software, uh, there's a lot of competition, uh, free software especially, um, sometimes big, huge companies, um, you know, and um, for the most part, I think we do a pretty good pretty good job of um, mixing it up there and and providing a lot of good value. Yeah, really. Well, uh, and how long you been, how long you've been doing this now? I've been there since uh, March. Okay, I was right. You're, it's new. <laughs> yeah, right. It's new. Exactly. Uh, well, you should get. I should get back with you in like about a year from now and say, "Hi, how's that? How's that tech support? Oh man, <laughs> I can see you start wearing well, it." <laughs> you know, that's only that, that's only one aspect of it. Um, and I did come through the ranks of the service desk, so I'm used to being on the phone and taking calls and everything. But uh, I do a lot of other parts. I get to go to conferences and schmooze with the network. And well, that's fun. Exactly. Uh, don't don't remember some of it, but uh, <laughs> well, Mike, listen, uh, I, I want to uh, thank you for uh, being here on the uh, show with us uh, again. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on the program uh, again. If if you uh, go to our uh, Go to our show notes page. This is for all the listeners. You go to our show notes page. It's right there on our home page. You'll see it says show notes. You click on that. You'll see today's show, uh, December the eighth, and uh, you'll see uh, our description of uh, Mike uh, on, and Sysaid. And there's actually a link to the Sysaid Technologies uh, website, so uh, you can see more of the uh, more of the information about what Mike is actually doing and uh, what Sysaid Technologies offers uh, to its clients. And we just keep that available. Uh, and that stays up for all time. So uh, at ComputerAmerica.com, just do, do our show notes page, and you'll, and you'll see it all for, for yourself. Um, again, thanks so much for being with us right, here. Thank you. And yeah. I'm looking forward to the GoTenna. I really want to listen to that. Well, you can stay. You can, you can, if you want, you can stay in the Hangouts, or you can go to the website and listen to it. Whatever you want to do, I'll leave it to you. Well, I'm, I'm going to go to the website because it's almost 11 o'clock here. So. Okay. Good enough. <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, thanks again for being right, here. Thank you. America. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you too. Good night. Right. Good night. Okay. All right. Well, there he goes. Again, it's Sys8 Technologies, uh, uh, and you can read more about that at, at the uh, at the, our website at ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, coming up in hour two, of course, we're going to have another news tips bulletin review from Marty Winston. Uh, and uh, what's he going to do this time? Uh, next hour, he's going to talk. Well, the first hour, he talked about the Abbey OCR technology. He's going to talk about something called the fugu. I thought fugu was a was a blowfish. It's a blowfish that uh, it's it's the one that's super deadly, and everyone's like, "Don't eat fugu; it, it will kill you." Yeah, it you. they say your tongue starts tingling first, and then you can't. Then it, it and then your tongue falls out. And no, your eyeball. It, well. atta it attacks your respiratory system, so you can't breathe, and basically you suffocate to death. What a wonderful way to go! What uh, What's the point of eating if you're not going to eat dangerously once in a while? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'm gonna have the McFood. Why, why? Why not have that, you know, stir-fried raccoon and see if you don't get parasites? Because that's yeah. fine. I'll order the McFugu. You know exactly. We'll get. We'll get you just take a oh, chance. Oh, the McFugu. Oh, yeah, love it. Instead of the fillet of fish, you know, get a McFugu. All right. Well, uh, we got hour two coming up, and as I said, we're gonna have another Logitech. Uh, have our two uh, Logitech winners, the final two. Um, on, on that, we'll do that as well. And um, uh, but our next hour uh, guest is going to be talking about a device uh, and I find this to be really fascinating because I don't I don't know too much about it I've done a little research on it but if um, the idea here is that um, if you're you know, in a, a dead cell area or you know you can't get cellular service or you're off the grid literally uh, and I know uh, this was one of the situations that this company was dealing with and they were in Brooklyn <laughs> Go figure, but uh, and only they're dead cell places even in in in, in our big cities. Um, it's going to allow you to still communicate with other cell phone users. And uh, how's that going to work? I mean, do they need? Uh, does everybody need a Go Tenna? Uh, does it work with that with them on only on one side? Does it take both? Um, what's the range of something like this? Uh, these are some of the I'm, questions. I'm thinking human chain. Yeah, well, I thought, wherever you are to wherever you need to go. I thought it's got two tin cups and a string. See, that doesn't work though, because you need you need taut you need taut string. Oh well, just pull it tight, you know. And that you should communicate, you know. 
Yeah, but over a couple hundred miles, it, it, it tends to fade. Yeah. Okay. Or, or especially if somebody in the middle just touches the string and, and then it doesn't vibrate. That that would be that would be bad. There you go. Okay. But anyway, Go Tenna is going to be our guest for the uh, second hour of the show. And as I said, we're going to have uh, uh, we're going to have our our two other Logitech Show Reminder winners. Again, just go to our contest page at computeramerica.com because it's all. Just go to the, under the interact menu. It says enter contest and click on the Logitech uh, register button. You'll see we have our, all the prizes are up again. Uh, the contest is going to go through Friday, January the 16th uh, at 12 uh, midnight Eastern time. Then over the winter we'll go with three more names, and on Monday, January the 19th, we'll announce the next three big winners. And the registration form is right there on the Logitech contest page, so it makes it really easy uh, to uh, register and get involved. Anyhow, uh, we're going to take a short break just for a few moments and then be back with Go Tenna. You're listening to the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, on the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. This is the Computer America Show. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight, Woo-hoo! Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at computeramerica.com. Hello and welcome into hour two of the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co host, Ben. And uh, again, thanks to uh, our first hour guest, uh, um, uh, Mr. Ma- Michael. Michael Slobodnik. Very nice fellow. Very, very nice. Uh, really enjoyed having him on the say, show. He, he's a chap. Yeah, good chap. And maybe we'll have him back on the show again, you know, uh, on a more, we'll get him back again. Uh, I mean, when we when we have technical issues like this, he seems to be very knowledgeable. Yeah. So we'll have him back on. Whenever, there's, whenever Windows release, uh, threatens to release something, yeah, like well, whenever Microsoft threatens to release something, maybe then. Yeah, maybe then. Absolutely. Uh <clears throat> Anyhow, it's, uh, this is the second hour of the show, and we have two more winners for our Logitech contest. Uh, we have our second place winner and the grand prize winner. We'll be announcing them uh, later on in the program. And we also have another news tips bulletin review from Marty Winston. We always have two new ones every Monday to go through the week, so uh, this will be the first time you're going to be hearing that, this one. It's about the fugu, in case you missed it. We don't know what the fugu is, except that it's a poisonous blowfish in the sushi world. And, uh, you know, many uh, sushi aficionados, lovers, have died from eating fugu. They make it a point to eat it. And and if the sushi master does not slice that fugu just right, if he punctures you know, well, uh, the little sack that contains the poison, they don't... Because I understand that they, they, they apprentice for like nine years on preparing this thing. And then and then after that, the before they can become an actually uh, uh, serve it, you know, in Japan. You know, all I have to say about sushi yes. is go watch Hero Dreams of Sushi. Who is it? On Netflix. Hero. J-I-R-O. Dreams. Okay. Yeah. Go watch that. And it is, I think, and there's two, there's two documentaries on sushi. And, mm-hmm. like, it follows this guy. He has been in the same shop since he was, like, 12. Yeah. And he's now like 80-something. He's been in the same shop for 70 years, doing the same thing every day for his entire life, just sushi. And? And, and, and the amount of training, purpose, dedication goes into sushi, you ain't going to see that from someone flipping burgers. <laughs> sushi, is, sushi is its own... Art form. Art form. It really is. So it's there There are many things we can talk about this, but... Do you? Do you eat, hmm? I don't actually have. Do you eat sushi, Ben? I do. Oh, okay. I, I I try some. Unfortunately, I've only had like a few kinds, and my favorite is still the California roll, which, by is- far. <laughs> <laughs> which isn't even sushi. It's just crab and like <laughs> celery, yeah, but uh, cucumber. Oh, yeah, avocado. But I need. I definitely need to try more. But I'm. I've tried a few. A few. Okay. All right. 
Uh, your brother, I think, is more into sushi. I've never seen squid and said, ew, why would someone eat that? Like, I, I'd eat it. I just haven't tried oh, it. Or octopus. Or I, I've, I've tried octopus, too. But, yeah, you know, it's... I feel like we're off topic a little bit. Can we? Okay. Well, okay. All right. Well, let's get to it, then. Uh, uh, in this hour, uh, we're going to be talking to Gotenna. Now, Gotenna uh, develops products for decentralized communication. Think about that for a moment. Um, they started working together to solve a problem they faced themselves, and that was the inability to communicate with others when they needed to most. Uh, I think that would that would uh, probably much solve that up. Uh, the Gotenna enables you to communicate without any need for central connectivity whatsoever. No cell towers, no Wi-Fi, no satellites. So when you're off the grid, you can still remain connected. In fact, Gotenna will even work if your smartphone is in airplane mode. Now, here to explain how this amazing little bit of technology works is Jay uh, Perdomo. Uh, Jay is G10's CTO and co-founder. Jay, welcome into Computer America. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, our pleasure. Um, well, obviously, uh, th this is, uh, uh, to me, is a very cool uh, and, and very intriguing uh, little... I'm actually, uh, um, I'm, I'm playing... I'm sort of playing dumb in the sense, I, uh, but uh, really not. I've actually seen and, and, and understand the uh, inner workings of this, but I still think it's an amazing device. And uh, so um, why don't you tell our listeners basically what is Gotenna and how does it work? Sure. Uh, Gotenna is a small device. You can think of it almost as a phone uh, accessory that pairs wirelessly with your smartphone and allows you through an app on the phone to communicate with other similarly uh, equipped devices without any reliance on central um, towers uh, or Wi-Fi or any other kind of infrastructure like that. Um, some, you know, as everyone probably knows by now, you know, our phones are, you know, great communications devices, yep. but those devices are reliant on central infrastructure to communicate. And if those towers are down for any reason, whether that be, it might be, you know, a disaster like Sandy or Katrina mm -hmm. that knocked out 25% of the towers in the 10 state area, or if you're just, you know, out of range, you know, you're out, you know, hiking or skiing or heck, you know, maybe you just don't want to use it because you know, because it's expensive and you're roaming. Um, this will allow you to communicate with other people uh, up to several miles away in a very natural, uh, seamless fashion that is, you know, basically we say if you know how to use iMessage or Google Maps, you would know how to use Gotenna. Now, how big is the device itself? I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at mm -hmm. pictures of the website, but why don't you relate to our, our listeners uh, how big uh, uh, the Gotenna is? Yeah, so the Gotenna can open and close. So when it's uh, closed and it's kind of in you know just portable mode, it's only about five inches long and about I'd say three quarters of an inch wide and only about half an inch thick. It's really small. It's less. It weighs less than two ounces. It's extraordinarily light. Um, it then extends out with a its antenna extends out another like two and a half inches or so. Uh -huh. So uh, the idea is that you know you would turn it on, pair it with your phone, and then just you know, throw it in your backpack or, you know, in your pocket or wherever you want. You can kind of forget about it. And then you just, you know, interact on your phone and you can use it to text with people that are, you know, around you that also have the same device. Now, does the Gotenna attach to your phone or does it somehow attach to the phone? I mean, even though I realize that it's a wireless device, but does it have to be attached to the phone or, or is the... Uh, Absolutely the, not. Okay, so the act of extending the antenna out, uh, which is only about a couple of inches, is also turns this device on? Is that... Uh, or is there a non-off switch? Correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah it, turn, yeah, it turns on with that and then it just pairs over Bluetooth. So you don't really, you know, you can basically have it anywhere within 30 feet of, of yourself, you know, more or less, okay, so, depending on where you are. All right, so you just turn it on, you can leave it on your desk or, or just uh, in your pocket or what have you, and, 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 and then you're going. So you, you mentioned it briefly, but let's uh, tell, uh, say again, what is the actual range of the GoTenna device? So the range of the device, uh, well, maybe I'll step back a little bit and kind of explain a little bit about how what the actual technology is. So it's very similar to, you know, kind of the more old school RF walkie-talkie kind of technology. But what we've done is that we've, uh, you know, not only miniaturized it and made it a lot cheaper because they were essentially a 2-watt VHF radio, we've also built into it um, our own uh, networking layer that allows you to use this in such a seamless way because, you know, as opposed to, you know, having to get on a channel and, 
find someone and listen to other people and all of the kind of problems you might have when you try to use uh, an industrial strength radio, you know, we didn't want people to have to deal with that. We wanted them to just be able to use their phones like they want to. So you don't now, have, so you don't, uh, so you don't have yeah. to go. You don't have to go CQ, CQ, or you know, or, or no, none of that. Yeah, none breaker, of that. breaker, breaker, breaker. So, none of that stuff. Okay, all right. None of that exactly. So that so so we are definitely you know much more range than you might expect from any kind of consumer radio because we are essentially industrial strength at two watts and VHF. Um, but the range will will vary. I mean that's kind of the thing of what happens with RF and it's dependent on where you are. So if you're in a city like, say, uh, New York you know, or Brooklyn, you're going to get about, about a half mile to a mile uh, point to point. And that's, you know, if you get any kind of altitude, you're going to get a lot more range. Now, if you're out in the outdoors, you're going to get significantly more than that. You can get maybe you know, three, four, five, six miles um, you know, if you're out in the woods. And again, if you get any kind of elevation, like if you get up on a rock or you happen to be closer to the peak of the mountain that you, see, that you happen to be uh, scaling, you can start getting, you know, multiple dozens of miles, you know. Uh, theoretically, the limit is like 50 miles, but most likely that's not going to happen most of the time. Yeah. I'd say that, you know, in most situations, if you get like into ideal circumstances, you're probably going to top out around 36 miles or so. But oh, the way we kind of look at it is that if you're hiking and you're more than, you know, two, three miles away from someone, you're probably about, you know, two, three hours hike or something like that from them, and you're not really hiking together anymore. What about over water, like boat to boat? Oh yeah, uh, on the water, the water is actually uh, very, very good for RF propagation, uh, for radio uh, propagation. So you sh should expect something around six to eight miles. Again, the difference being like, are you on the deck of the boat or are right. you, you know, up on that, you know, that thing that they can go up on? I guess in old pirate ships. I don't know if they still do that though. <laughs> Bird's nest. <laughs> Crow's nest. Really? Yeah. Crow's nest. Crow's nest. Yeah, but you know, but I, there we go. If you're, if you're on the uh, on a fishing boat, you know, you're up on the top of it. You know, you could uh, certainly get some good range. Um, so it, you say it's two. It's a two watt radio. Now, is this um, push to talk or something, or do you get full duplex? No. This? So the features that we the features we offer on uh, on Gotenna are two primary ones, and we call it, we think of it as sh short form data. So primarily text. So there's no voice. Okay. It's Text messaging, got it, and the sharing of GPS coordinates. Okay. So we basically leverage the phone that you already have in your pocket, and enable it to communicate with other phones. And so we can basically use its sensors, its GPS, anything that your phone can already do. We then just become the data channel that allows you to share with other people got it. when you're not connected. And beyond, and we don't just send the GPS because you know if you just get a set of coordinates, how helpful is that really? Uh, what we do is we inside the app we also have an offline very high detail um, map built in mm -hmm. so that you can contextualize where people's locations are when they send them to you and they don't only have to send their own location they can also drop a pin on the map and say you know let's rendezvous here or you know this is the campsite or here's where we're watching you know whatever's going on you can basically share other locations with each other and you can do three primary kinds of communication so for for the text messaging and the GPS, you can do it in three different ways. Mm -hmm. One is that you can do private one-to-one -one messaging, which is completely encrypted end-to-end. -end. Mm -hmm. You can also do private uh, encrypted one-to-many, so group chat. And you can also do a completely public chat, which is not encrypted, which we call shouts, which is a way to basically talk to anyone around you, whether you know them or not. And we think that could be particularly helpful in emergency situations when you know, people are you know, trying to coordinate resources or help each other out in some way or another. Or if you just want to, you know, talk to somebody, like the, like, like, just, I mean, chat with somebody. Uh, yeah, it could be like a chat room. Yeah. Exactly, and you just want to see who's around and who has a. Now it only works with. So each phone has to have a GoTenna device for this to communicate, correct? Correct. Okay, so, uh, so you can say, hey, I'm just wanting to see if there's any, if there are any GoTennas out there. Anybody want to talk? You know, you could do that. But uh, exactly. I, I have a feeling that probably. What would you say is the most, uh, in your experience so far, what, what, what do you think will be the most used uh, uh, application for this product? Yeah, so we are really focused right now to start on, with the outdoor market, and not even more than the outdoor market, but just people that are doing things in groups that might be you know, out of range. So, two, so just to kind of pop them in right now, we are currently selling them on pre-order on our website at a discounted $150 for two units. And the reason we sell them in pairs is because you know, 
it's not, you know, one go 10 by itself is not really going to be that helpful. Mm. You know, it's about really doing this as like a network and, you know, find, you know, the idea is that you'd get it with your family or your friends and you're all going out to, you know, you're out hiking, you're, you're going on a hiking or skiing trip or maybe you're going to a music festival or something along those lines, which is another place where uh, cell networks usually um, break down. And when you go there with your group of friends, you are always, you know, you make sure that you can kind of connect and you can split up and you can find each other uh, no matter what. So we think that's the primary use case that we're starting with. But looking at kind of our long-term vision for where, where we want to take Gotenna is that even though that's where we start, uh, we do think that there's a very, very big um, value in the concept of decentralized communication, whether it's for resiliency or security or any of the other reasons that people might want to use Gotenna, we think that there's, you know, as you know, as great as the cell networks and all that are today, and they are fantastic. You know, it's I think it's almost magical the fact that you could, you know, FaceTime with your cat while you're in your car if you want to nowadays. However, those systems are inherently very fragile because they have they have to rely on um, on central infrastructure, and if the power goes out or the wind blows too hard or too many people are in too many areas, um, everything goes down. And frankly, when they go down is when you need them most. And that's, you know, we, you know, we want to be, we want to fill that gap. And beyond that, you know, as we start looking at, you know, the next billion people that are still not connected in any way, uh, much less the internet, they're not even thinking about Facebook yet. They still just need some kind of local level uh, community uh, communications capabilities we think that's somewhere that we can start helping as well. Now, uh, we have a, a, one of our chat room participants has a question for you. Uh, basically, uh, she wants to know how you came up with the idea for this device. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the uh, idea for Gotenna was born out of a couple of experiences that uh, me and my co-founder, who's actually my sister, uh, went through right around the same time. I had been going to a bunch of uh, different kinds of large events, music festivals, um, also... Um, uh, uh, you know, sports events and like conferences for work, and I could never text anyone. And I'd always, you know, if I got split up from any way because I was going to the bathroom or something like that, it was really, really hard to find anyone again. Because if you're in a mass of a hundred thousand people, you and you get split up, you will not find each other again. Mm-hmm. And around that same time, um, uh, Sandy hit New York, and my sister was here in uh, New York, and basically, you know, one of the most you know interconnected cities in the world had almost half of its entire population cut off with the, the power that got knocked out in the sure. lower regions. Mm-hmm. So with those two experiences in there, we started thinking about, you know, how, you know, what is something that could, you know, fix this? How can we, how can we enable communications when other things go down? And we look to, you know, what is it that the professionals still rely on? Yeah. You know, as great as LTE and all the other things that are out there are today, at the end of the day, the police, the military, rescue services, all the people that, you know, really need and really understand the importance of communication, they all still rely on old school, kind of old school RF technology. And we started thinking, how can we make that more usable, you know, more user friendly, more feature rich and more in line with the experience that people, you know, ex- you know, expect from their phones today. And that's kind of where things were, you know, started up from. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, one, another one of our chat members asked the question. It was a comment and also asked, sort of asked the question. You know, he said, wasn't there some guy several years ago who got stranded in a snowstorm with his family and tried to get for help? And then he says, would this device would have uh, really been great for him and his family? What's your thoughts? Yeah. On that? I would think that it would. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we, you know, we even have like a family pack on the on the on the website for people to grab. And the idea is that, yeah, we think that you know there are people that are going to be buying this, uh, you know, for because they have a specific activity that they want to go, you know, they want to have it because they're going to do something in a group, and they know that they're probably going to be, you know, out of touch in some way. However, there's a lot of people that have been um, have been interested in Gotenna purely from a, you know. Uh, security point of view, a, a kind of prepare, a, call it disaster preparedness. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that, you know, it's like maybe we're not going to use Gotenna every single day, but there's a big value in us, you know, at least having one, you know, in the glove compartment or having one at the house because, you know, it, it, you know, the cell networks can go down, you know, wherever. I mean, they've gone down, you know, when the tornadoes hit in Oklahoma, I think that was like last year, no one could really communicate for two, three days. And 
those are exactly the times that you really need to get in touch with not only you know your you know your friends and family and the people you care about, but potentially with people that could you know help you as well, whether they be neighbors or professionals. Yeah, no, and and I think something of like this would certainly certainly uh, do the trick because although you wouldn't be able to talk to them, you certainly would be able to text to them and communicate, and that's the most important thing. And not only that, uh, with the GPS uh, uh, location ability. Uh, they can only hear you, but they, you know they could find you too if you were lost, let's say, or stranded. Absolutely, stranded in the woods yeah. or in a snowstorm, or you know just find yourself inaccessible. Uh, inaccessible. Uh, you, you I think there was even one who uh, there was a gentleman who was uh, like he actually had to cut his own arm off because he was he was in a canyon with a bolt. Oh wait, no, that's no. Uh, that was yeah, a, no, that's 127 hours. My bad. That's a movie. <laughs> no, that was a different story. Uh, he could have texted with the one arm, though, I guess, maybe. But, you know. <laughs> Reached into his pocket and said, I haven't cut. Yeah, man. Exactly. Uh, but, um, but. Oh, speaking of that person, by the way, I mean, there's actually two. Uh, that actually reminds me of two other things that uh, Gotenna has as well, beyond just the texting. Yeah. It also has the ability to go into an emergency beacon mode. So if a person is not able to text, uh, either through their phone or through a button that's on the device itself, we can actually go into a beacon mode that just shares your last GPS location with anyone around you so that, you know, you might not be able to explain what happened to you because you're somehow inca incapacitated, but people can come, you know, find you anyway. And then the other thing, too, which I, uh, I actually really, really like, because sometimes people ask, like, all right, you know, well, I, you know I'd love to do voice. And there's a variety of reasons for why we didn't do voice. Um, I, I don't know if we need to go into them now, but... What I really like about text messaging is, A, it's, it's mostly because it's asynchronous. You know, you don't have to be listening at the very moment that someone talks to you to get a message. You know, you can be, you know, maybe you're climbing, you know, a, a rock face or something like that. And, you, you know, you don't have time to, like, you know, listen to your radio and see what's going on. But you can get all your messages. And then when you get to the top or, you know, in some kind of safe place, you can then check your messages later, which, again, makes it a lot easier for multiple people to communicate with each other. Now, does this uh, does GoTenna uh, drain your cell phone battery uh, any faster, or, or is it, what, what kind of a load does it put no. on? No. No. So it has its own battery uh, built into it, uh, oh. and it's uh, rated to last over 24 hours. Um, and what? It, so when we say that you can, you know, turn your phone off into airplane mode, we mean if you put your phone into airplane mode and only turn on the Bluetooth your phone will actually last an extraordinarily long time. It will last, you know, a week or two. Um, because a lot of times people say, hey, but my phone's going to, like, die. And the latest version of Bluetooth, known as Bluetooth Low Energy, it sips the battery. Like, essentially, using Gotenna will have no noticeable effect on your battery life. Um, the thing that really kills your phone is when it's trying to connect to the cell towers particularly when it can't reach them because it'll actually up its power trying to get to one, and that's when they start draining down really, really quickly. Uh, you know, quick pro tip for people sometimes, that, I don't know if they know it, but if, you should, if you're down in the subway or something, put your phone in airplane mode. You're, you'll actually end up using a lot less battery for that short trip. Oh, huh. well, that's, uh, you know, that, that's actually really good advice. I, I noticed that, you know, it really does tend to go down when it does things like that. Um, it's, uh, so it, it uh, was that about like I don't want to say by design? It was obviously by design, but I mean, uh, are there any plans to use this uh, the GoTenant as like? Do you see it branching out as anything else other than you know kind of a, a a an emergency slash you know just no reception like something that people keep in in emergency kits and cars and, th and things like that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's kind of what I was uh, alluding to a little bit before is that, you know, there is this kind of niche use case that we're starting off with right now. Um, but we have a lot of plans in the works for a variety of different uh, products that will all uh, be able to work with each other, but they'll have different kinds of features. Um, for, you know, some of our future models, they might, like, you know, uh, provide voice as well. But we also have um, a, a feature in the works right now where people can start using uh, go tennis as gateways and there's two main things that we're working on right now that I think you know people get very excited about but are not part of you know version one right now um, one is that uh, for some future models depending on how some conversations go with the FCC which is always you know you know a little bit complicated but so far going okay um, we are planning on uh, developing a, the ability to do multi-hop uh, meshing 
So the first step right now is just the point to point, but once we start working in, um, in multi-hop meshing, yeah. and there's a variety of different paths we have to get to there, um, we, things get really, really interesting when it comes to actually making a decentralized network that is not just you know, for an emergency, but it could just be you know, a free communication system, uh, particularly when you start putting in um, gateway nodes, whether it's a base station or somebody who does have 3G coverage, we can then start hopping back into the network. So if you know, you know, there's say 15 people in a valley with Gotenas, and they can't, none of them have cell service, but there's you know a 16th person that's you know up on a ridge and has one bar of 3G, then everyone else can use that person to you know hop back into the network and send normal text messages and call for help or whatever or you know or just you know just use them as a way to. Um, you know, kind of bring some level of internet, uh, you know, more traditional network access to a lot of people. And that's some of the stuff we're looking at for um, some versions of our products. So when we start looking at, you know, developing countries that either are, you know, just don't have a lot of coverage in areas, or if they do, it's too expensive for people to afford, or maybe sometimes even, you know, repressive regimes, you know, like if there's a, an area that, you know, they're shutting down Twitter or they're shutting down whatever, because there's a protest, um, you know, Gotenna could be a you know a great uh, tool to enable you know free, private, resilient communications for everyone. That you know, you and I might be thinking of the exact same thing. Uh, I was just about to bring up that in in China, with all the student protests that was going on there, uh, they actually shut down cell, cell service, and they uh, an app actually got a lot of traction there. I think it was called like Fire Chat or something like that. Fire, and I think yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's uh, something along those lines. Yeah, so FireChat is actually we, we, it's, a, it's a great uh, little a little piece of technology there. So what FireChat does is they um, they do exactly what I was describing with the meshing, but they mesh over Bluetooth and and Wi-Fi basically. And that's what's nice about that is that you don't actually need any external piece of hardware, uh, which I you know I promise you if I could if we could provide the kind of range. And reliability without, you know, just through an app on your phone. Trust me, I would have loved to do that because making hardware is really hard. <laughs> um, but uh, the problem with that system is that it's great if you're all really close to each other, which happens to be, you know, in the in the case of the Hong Kong protesters, they're all kind of, you know, elbow to elbow, and they were, you know, relatively, you know, uh, peaceful. So when you have, you know, a bunch of people in a small, like a, a lot, a lot of people in a small area and you can actually hop from Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, then it's great. However, if anyone was more than, you know, 30 or 40 feet away from the next person, then that wouldn't work anymore. And that would essentially kind of collapse right away. And we think that's the big difference of why, you know, of what Gotenna can do is that, you know, our range isn't measured in feet, it's measured in miles. And there's just a lot more you can do when it comes to, you know, counting on something when you have that level of, of, um, of you know, range and resiliency. Wow. Um, so, so, uh, th now this product is not available yet. You're saying that, uh, uh when will it be? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's on pre-sale pre right now, 50% off on gotenna.com. Um, and we are in the middle of manufacturing right now and we are aiming to ship, uh, kind of, you know, basically end of, you know, end of winter. Um, so, you know, think kind of like end of Q1, kind of that area. Okay. So we're a few months away. I'd say, you know, you know, three, you know, three-ish months or something along those lines uh, till we start being able to, you know, ship these out and put them in people's hands. What kind, uh, what kind of a reaction are you getting uh, when people hear uh, uh, about this, uh, Jay? What kind of response are you getting? Yeah, uh, we, we, I would say that most people are extraordinarily excited. Um, and what's really interesting and I think is really rewarding is just the how many how many people come to us with just different applications of the technology? And I think that's what really excites me is that, look, we're focused right now on the, you know, on the, you know, the mobile messaging and location use case for, you know, consumers and professionals and, you know, whoever else might need that. However, if you really boil down what we've done is that we have essentially made kind of what I sometimes call the inverted Bluetooth, as opposed to being very short range and very high data, we're extremely long range and low data. And we are offering that as a tool to all sorts of people out there via um, our open SDK. It's a little thing so that you can basically, other people can build 
other applications on top of our hardware. And there has been a massive response from people from all over the world that just want to make different applications of our technology for a variety of different reasons. And I think that's really, really rewarding. Um, and then just the fact that, you know, people come to me and, you know, one of the things I had never even thought of was cruise ships. You know, people yeah. were like, oh, my God, this would be perfect for cruise ships. And I was like, <laughs> wow, I never even thought of that because, you know, that just happens to not be my personal demographic. But yeah, sure. it's people come. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes it makes absolute, it makes absolute sense. Uh, so if, if they want to, they can go to we actually have a link on our show notes page at computeramerica.com and you can check uh, the go tenant out for yourself. Uh, also, I think you can follow them uh, you on Twitter at at go as well. And also, uh, they can also follow you on, on Facebook, as, and you also on Instagram, too. Um, uh, we'll put all that up on our show notes page as well. Uh, Jay, a really interesting product, very cool product, and uh, uh, thanks so much for being with us here uh, to let our listeners know about the GoTenna. Great, and thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. All right, Jay, you take care. Have a good evening. Good night. All right, good night. Bye-bye. All right, so uh, coming up in uh, hour two, we're going to, uh, the rest of the hour, we're going to have the rest of our uh, um, uh, Logitech winners. We'll come back with an announcement. A brand new, uh, new simple review from Multi Review, from Marty Winston. You listen to the Computer America show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. Ben and I will be right back. Stay with us. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. Their mission is to protect and enhance the lives of companion animals and the people who love them. Their no-kill rescue shelter is open year-round, making it easy for people to adopt their best new friend. This year, Brother Wolf will find homes for over 2,400 orphan dogs, puppies, cats, and kittens. All have ended up as an orphan through no fault of their own. Brother Wolf has created a safe, nurturing environment where these special animals can heal emotionally and physically until they find a lifelong home. Their life-saving transport program brings dogs and puppies from overcrowded shelters in the south to rescues in the north where homes are easier to find. Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is a 501c3 organization. To learn more about their life-saving work and to make a donation, visit their website at www.bwar.org. That's www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-866-663-MYTV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. So, disable the cable and get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. Right now, to sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and up to four rooms. And there's no equipment to buy. That includes your free HD TV upgrade, your free DVR upgrade, and your free professional installation. And the best part, the pristine digital picture and sound. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. So, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. 1-866-663-MYTV. Disable the cable, cut costs, and get more. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. 1-866-663-MYTV. Ahoy, this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Ahoy. And this time... I'm almost afraid to pronounce this product name. It's spelled F-U-G-O-O, -O, so let's call it Fagu. <laughs> the Fagu is one of the rare breed of Bluetooth speakers that's worth considering for people who crave more than just playing music out loud, who crave some level of desire for actual fidelity as well. With six drivers, four active and two passive, it does a good job of presenting instrumental highs and lows, despite being not much bigger than a hot dog on a bun. It also boasts up to 40 hours of runtime per charge and claims we really didn't want to test for these to be water, snow, dust, sand, and dirt proof. You can get accessories for it, including outer casings they call jackets, a strap mount, a bike mount, and more. Bottom line, the sleek Fagu Bluetooth speaker offers unusually high survivability, longevity, and most of all, fidelity. 
This is Marty Winston with the News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. You're right, that did sound like Fugu. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's uh, 33 minutes past the hour, and uh, we just got finished talking to uh, Gotenna. It's a very interesting product. You yeah. should definitely check it out if you, uh, you know, we talked about a few use cases, and he said that, you know, I like the cruise ship uh, uh, yeah. thing. Yeah, even though he makes the product, or you know, even though his company makes a product, doesn't mean they've thought of every use case. So you know, feel free to mull it over, think it over. I think we asked plenty of questions. Um, you can always go to their site, uh, you know, gotenna.com, and hey, it might be for you. Yeah, it just might. Okay, very cool. Uh, before we get uh, before we go our news, let's do another uh, uh, winner. Oh uh, yeah, that too. Let's do another Logitech one. Okay. Um, we already did the third place runner, which is the Logitech HD Webcam C310. This is for the Logitech G400S gaming mouse. Uh, that's 60 bucks. Okay. Uh, this is a corded mouse, uh, but it's for gaming and it has an incredible DPI, all these wonderful features on it. It's a beautiful mouse. And uh, this prize goes to. Camera Sanity. Camera Sanity, congratulations! You're this. Uh, you're our second prize winner. Uh, uh, Tamara listens to Computer America in Garland, Texas. All right, Garland, Texas. Oh, and she actually, uh, Tamara left a comment. She says, the "Comment was thank you for this amazing opportunity to win. Uh, one thing off my bucket list if I won." <laughs> okay, well there you go. Well, I'm glad we can make your bucket list that much shorter so you can... Yes, exactly. So there it is. longer, hopefully? I don't know. Live longer or, or just do more things. So anyway, but now you can say you won uh, something on Computer America. That's one thing off your bucket list. You know, before I die, I want to win something from Computer America. Well, there it is. Anyway, you on everyone's bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> can really you say again? Really should. Really should. Yes, really should. Yes. Anyway, congratulations to uh, Tamara Sanity uh, being our second place winner. We have... Our first place grand prize winner coming up in a few minute, uh, a few moments. But right now, I think we should do some computer and technology news, don't you? I think so. All right, let's do it. Tonight's computer and technology. Oh, Craig! Oh, 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 Craig! Yes. Tell people who it's brought to you by. Say again. Tell people who is brought who's brought to you by. Tonight's computer and technology news. Yeah. It's brought to you by Slimware Utilities. There we go. The official optimization software of Computer America. You can visit them at slimwareutilities.com to clean, speed up, and optimize your Windows system absolutely free. There you go. Slimwareutilities.com. In our first story of the evening, um, and it's sort of related to what we were talking about uh, in the first hour is that Windows 10 is expected to release in early fall of next year. This again from Paul Lilly. This was released today. The general release time frame for Windows 10 gets more narrow. Uh, in the past we were told that Windows 10 would launch in the public sometime in late 2015 when while no specific release date has yet been set, Microsoft has at least tightened the launch window by revealing Windows 10 is on track to come out in late summer or early fall of next year. That's according to Microsoft Chief Operating Officer Kevin Turner, who talked a little about Windows 10 release at a Credit, Sw a Credit Swiss technology conference uh, recently. Um, the other thing to extrapolate from all of this is that Windows 10's ongoing development appears to be on schedule and coming along without any hiccups that might cause a delay. And according to CNET, Microsoft next month will show off its January technology preview of Windows 10 along with a first preview of the Windows 10 mobile build that will run on Windows phones, ARM tablets, and Intel tablets. Windows 10 is the next major release of Windows after Windows 8 slash 8.1. Microsoft decided to skip over Windows 9 because the next version is supposed to be such a drastic change that a single number jump just wouldn't do it justice. There you go. It's a marketing reason. Don't let them fool you, folks. It's all marketing. It's all marketing. 
It's all marketing. Okay. It's so different. It needs two numbers, not just one, but two. Yeah. Uh, really? Uh -huh. That's silly. Um, yeah, so computer news, computer news, computer news. I know I sent you some. I did not read any of them. So, you did not? Okay. No, uh, no, but um, here's one. A gentleman died today. <laughs> okay, that's news. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're starting off, we're starting off on a cheery note. Some guy died tonight. <laughs> not just some guy, though. Yeah. Mr. Ralph H. Bear. Oh. Father of video games. Dies at 92. Really? Wrecked his Harley up on Dead Man's Curve. Mm. Wow. I don't think so. Anyways, a gaming legend pass, passes away. If you play video games at home, you have Ralph H. Bear in part to thank for that. For those of you who are not familiar with the name, Bear was a video game pioneer who led the development team that created the Magnavox Odyssey. I remember that. Ooh. The first commercial home game console with a mere 40 transistors and 40 diodes. Sadly, Ralph H. Bear died last Saturday at his home in Manchester, New Hampshire at the age of 92. Was he playing a video game? When, uh, we can hope he had paddle in hand. Okay. So, remarkably, Bear was still tinkering and inventing right up until his death. Yeah. However, he's best known for his uh, to his contributions to early gaming and helping create an industry that now is estimated to be worth over $90 billion. It all started with the Odyssey, which set in motion being able to play games at home. Not long after, Atari debuted Pong. Uh, uh, yeah. Pong, the first arcade video game, Magnavox ended up suing Atari, claiming that Pong was too similar to a tennis game from Odyssey. Mm. Atari settled the suit for $700,000 and became Odyssey's second licensee, the New York Times uh, reports. Wow. So Magnavox would go on to sue several other companies over the next two decades, winning over $100 million. Wow, places like, That's when you're the first, you get imitators. Yeah. And the only thing to do with imitators is to sue them like crazy for 20 years and get yourself $100 million. Mm. So Bayer, who, testifi who testified in most of the lawsuits, amassed more than 150 U.S. and foreign patents for a range of inventions that include talking doormats and greeting cards. <laughs> he also co-invented the, the iconic Simon game with Howard oh, Wilson. I love that game. Simon? No, yes, the, Simon, that was great. Yeah, yeah the four-tone, uh, four-colored yeah. game. Yeah, it's a great... I actually have Simon now on my iPhone. I can play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at least a version of Simon. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, coming up with novel ideas and, and converting them into real products has always been a natural as breathing for me, Bear wrote, Bear wrote in 2005. Uh, video games in the beginning, which was the name of his autobiography. Bear is survived by his two sons, James and Mark, and his daughter Nancy Bear, and four grandchildren. So I, I wondered, uh, do they play video games? No. <laughs> That's how ironic would no, that? No, but I mean, at ninety-two, a couple of kids, an entire industry spawning from him. Yeah. Good on the man. Yeah, he he has a wonderful legacy he leaves behind. Yep. Exactly. Uh, did you ever play? You never. You don't remember the Odyssey, do you? I actually had an Odyssey. No. Uh, again, you know, Pong, sure. The original tennis, sure. But no, I don't remember any of the consoles that came on. Yeah. No, I I I, I remember the Odyssey. Uh. Well, anyhow. We wax, anyhow. We wax nostalgic. Uh, here's a story from Popular Science uh, that Ben found, which is kind of a, and it's got it shows a vision of Cortana on it. And it asks the question, could desktop computers be the best home for virtual assistants? It says the possibilities are far, are far beyond the current mobile breed. See, like just the title of this article mm -hmm. made me think. Yeah. It didn't make you think? Yeah, it does. Like just the title, it's like we're so used to just having virtual assistants, quote unquote, which are just, you know, overcomplicated. Uh, voice commands, like 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 we're used to that just being on the phones and being you know an easier way quote unquote to navigate your phone because it's a phone it's small it's tiny it's hard to get around so why not use your voice which you know you don't have to touch anything you can navigate that way. Yep. But think of all the resources that yeah. computers have compared to phones. How much yeah. more powerful these programs could be. Yeah. Well, it, it goes at the point whether it's the USS Enterprise, uh, ship computer, the bat computer, or even HAL. The future has always promised us smarter, more helpful, and sure, 
at times more dangerous computer intelligence. But despite the existing of the existence of virtual assistants such as Apple Siri and Microsoft's Cortana, that future has always seemed just a little bit out of reach. Uh, modern virtual assistants are no more capable of holding a truly intelligent conversation than they can brew you up a cup of tea, Earl Grey, hot. Of course, a Star Trek reference there. But what might but but part of what might be holding the intelligent assistant back could be its close ties to the mobile platform, you know, uh, which you mentioned, Ben. Um, one is power, in both a metaphorical and literal sense. Despite increasing the sophistication of mobile devices, their processing power still pales in comparison with desktop machines. More power could, for example, let the assistant process speech on board the machine rather than sending the information over the network to a company's servers that could enable faster response time, making the assistant snappier and forestalling some of those inevitable network ha hang-ups. That's very true, by the way. You know, a lot of people don't realize that Siri and Cortana and everything are really not on your phone. You're sending it to... The cloud. Yeah. It's not really processed on the phone. It's being processed somewhere else and then sent the response being sent back to you. So uh, now if you could have more of that on your computer, uh, I'm sure it would still have to go out to the Internet from time to time. But still, more of the processing done on the computer, that would be that, it, that would be cool. It'd be quicker. It, it, it'd be quicker and it could be more ingrained into what you're doing. Like it would actually be accessing files on your computer instead of retrieving them from some server and then bring them back to you. Right. Of course, another thing is batteries. Now, mobile devices are also reliant on batteries, which means they have to worry about power efficiency. They need to limit tasks, especially processor or network intensive ones, so that the phone doesn't rapidly exhaust its power reserves. In Apple's recent iOS 8 release, it introduced a feature called Hey Siri, and I've been using that. I really like that. Was such to trigger the assistant by saying the, the aforementioned phrase, but because of rightful concerns about battery life, it currently only functions when the device is plugged in. Okay. Great if you can use it in the car or while you're lying in bed, but less useful if you're just around the house. That's true. I mean, I use it. I'll go. To, I'll set, you know. I'll, I'll use that, that that term, and I'll say set the alarm. For see, the, you don't want to say it because you have your phone right next to you. Yeah, it's right next to me. We'll do it exactly. But see, that's Apple didn't pioneer that. Who did? Uh, I know that Xbox has been using it before. Hey Siri, you know that you know you just say the term Xbox, and then you could say go somewhere else. And then Google also had one where it was okay or whatever. Okay. All right. It was like okay, and then it would start listening. Or you know, Xbox. You say Xbox, and it started listening. And so Apple just kind of took the idea, which you know, again, no one should patent these ideas, but you know, they weren't the first to come up with it. Just want to point that out. Well, the article goes on quite a bit, but it, it kind of it, it sums it up as that you know that there's every possibility that what we actually show up, what what actually shows up when Windows 10 arrives next year, will be more complex and ambitious than what we've seen to date. And the author says, I'm hold, holding out hope for an intelligent assistant that's even smarter than what we have now and 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 if it could talk a little bit like Paul Bettany I don't know who that is that's just much better I don't know who Paul Bettany is it's just some reference Paul Bettany yeah you can I don't know who Paul Bettany is but he says evidently he likes it he says it'll be better if it does that okay okay All um right. yeah no we uh we have a little more time here and you know this one is is like the the URLs because when I send stories to Craig, they just send URLs uh, of all the articles. And PopSci, for the last couple days, I'm not sure if anyone has ever had this problem, but whenever you want to link something, the length of the URL can get bothersome. Like it gets really long. And PopSci, uh, Popular Science or PopSci.com, has been really bad at, lately because it kind of has like a double URL. And just over this past weekend, they fixed it. So good on PopSci. I'm, I'm glad they did that. It was a pet peeve, and right. you know, it needed fixing. And so what really caught me was that the the URL of this, they shortened it to China's Got Pain Beam. <laughs> PopSci.com forward slash China's Got Pain Beam. Okay. And, what it, and the actual story is China's new long-range weapon causes non-lethal pain from far away. Wow. Which, again, is just shortened to China's Got Pain Beam. Okay. <laughs> so nothing says this is my deserted island better than 
uh, ethically questionable sci-fi technology. So, you know, uh, a Chinese defense company recently unveiled a long-range weapon that can cause people overwhelming pain without killing them. Hmm. I wonder how many times they had to test that before they're like, eh, okay, he's not yeah. dead. I mean, he's squirming. You know, he's dead though. I, it looks like it has a, a direct TV dish on the truck. Maybe they're subjecting them to HBO Go or something. Maybe that's. A... No, no, come on, Craig. H, we like HBO Go. It has to be, um, I don't know, MTV. <laughs> MTV, okay. Sixteen pregnant marathons. <laughs> so, um, IHS Jane's reports that the system known as PolyWB1. Oh, so it actually sub, uh, subjects them to the WB. Very nice. He uses millimeter wave beams to scald targets from up to a kilometer away. Wow. When the beam strikes a person, it excites water molecules just under his or her skin, heating them up enough to cause extraordinary, extraordinary pain. Yeah, you're getting microwaved. <laughs> you're getting microwaved from a kilometer away. Your microwave oven does the same thing to your leftovers. Exactly, article. Thank you. The plan, it seems, is to mount the WB-1 on ships, likely those patrolling disputed waters. The U.S. deployed its own non-lethal microwave beam as a crowd control weapon in Afghanistan. I saw that thing. That was creepy. Mm. But the device called the Raytheon Active Denial System, or ADS, was recalled in 2010 without ever seeing it used. Critics at home and abroad raised serious questions about the ethics of using a pain beam to break up riots. Mm. So, you know, and they, they have an article here and they have a 60-minute clip of, you know, just exactly what you're talking about when you, you know, when essentially you're talking about microwaving people from a kilometer away yeah. and just what that entails. So the military, in an attempt to demonstrate that the ads could be used humanely with certain safeguards, offered some journalists a chance to try it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we promise it's not lethal. Hey, you journalist, come here. Come here for a second. <laughs> And no one tried it. No, but some people tried it. So the reporter walks away unscathed, and that's the point. A non-lethal, non-gruesome weapon empowers militaries to enforce their will without generating the sort of shocking images that provoke condemnation and dissent. So as China moves forward with its microwave system, the world may get another test case for a new generation of television-friendly crowd control. Well, it's like rubber bullets, you know? Uh, it's that non-lethal crowd. It's that non-lethal crowd control. Right, rubber bullets and pepper spray, you know, and tear gas, you know. Yep. This is this is just another uh, something that they could add to the 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 arsenal. Although it's a little different because it, well, no, it. The way I've heard I, I've heard it explained was it's like having an extremely bad sunburn, like. After it's done, you know, the, the water molecules realign and, and they aren't excited anymore, but just the feeling of getting hit by it, like, you know, that stinging all over, just general pain? Mm -hmm. it, like having an extremely bad sunburn all over your body. Like, it, it's not like, oh, that guy's really tough. He's going to stand there and take it. No, your the water molecules in your body are freaking out and you need to get away from there immediately. Mm. So it, it's, it's extremely painful, but after you walk away and you walk it off for a couple minutes... You're you're completely fine. Wow, unlike a sunburn, which will last for days. Yeah, uh, you know, unlike a sunburn, or even you know, rubber bullets, which leave bruises, and you know, that yeah. kind of thing. It's it's, I don't know. I just don't like being a you know, seeing seeing something a kilometer away and being shot with a beam, and it's it, it's sci-fi and it's weird, and and and, and yeah. yeah. But it, maybe it works. It, 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 it totally works. It's just you know, should you, but. Better than getting shot. Yeah, uh, yes, it is. A lot better than getting shot. Uh, this, let's do this quickly. Oh no, we need to do our our. Oh yeah, our last um, contest winner. Yeah, let's do our uh, our last uh, uh, winner. And then one last story. And then one last story. Okay, so then this is for the grand prize winner. This is for the Logitech X300 mobile wireless stereo speaker, valued at seventy dollars. You get to pick the color, and that winner is James. Jenkins. James Jenkins, congratulations. You are our first place winner. Uh, James listens to, us, listens to us in Montclair, California. And he actually has a comment as well. His comment is, I've logitech Is Logitech a, a verb? I guess I've logitech You can turn into one. I've logitech since my first 286 PC. 
There you go. Well, <laughs> well, I guess now hopefully you'll Logitech uh, on into the uh, the 2015 and beyond. Now keep Logiteching on. Keep Logiteching on. Yes, congratulations. So again, uh, as a roundup, uh, our third place winner uh, for the Logitech HC Webcam C310 is Patricia Shadden in Hayward, California. Our second place uh, winner for the Logitech G400S Gaming Mouse is Tamara Sanity. And our number one first place grand prize winner for the Logitech X300 Mobile Wireless uh, Stereo Speaker. You get to pick the color. James Jenkins. Congratulations to all of you for playing, and uh, you know, and uh, and congratulations for you know playing our Logitech contest on Computer America. Again, our Logitech contest is up and running. Just go to our contest page at ComputerAmerica.com, and you can get your entry in now. That will go through the 15th of January is when we uh, when that one finishes up. So let's do this uh, next story here from Engadget. Unboxed Sonyus. Sony's 20th anniversary edition of the PlayStation 4 is gorgeous, it's rare, and it's totally sold out. <laughs> they made one. They that, made, that's really rare. Yeah, 12,300 uh, of them they made, and it, the numbers right about. Nostalgia is a powerful tool, and Sony knows exactly how to weld it. You need only glimpse the 20th anniversary edition PlayStation 4 in real life to fully comprehend that. Uh, the limited edition console, which comes with an original gray paint job, patterned faceplate, and colorful PS logo that harkens back to the original PlayStation from 1994, is a rare issue. Only 12,300 exist in the world. And not to rub it in, but we have one of our very own, <laughs> number 8,262 to be exact. I'm in Gadget. What's more... If you didn't lock in a pre-order for this one this past Sunday, December the 6th, your chances of getting it now are pretty much slim to none. That's it. Game over. Suck it up and move on. After <laughs> all, it's only a fancy paint job, right? Yeah, keep telling yourself that. Oh, sure. You could probably find one up for a resale online for the simple piece uh, price of your soul, your unborn child's soul, and several of your nearest and dearest's soul. And then maybe toss in the souls of a few innocent bystanders in your mailman for good measure. <laughs> but the point is, unless you're an obsessive collector that regularly swan dives into a money bin that has three anthropomorphic ducks as nephews, you'll just have to make do with a plain white or black PlayStation 4. Them's the breaks, folks. So why not deal with the disappointment by watching us unwrap the golden ticket that is the 20th anniversary console? It'll ease the pain, we promise you. And they show pictures of showing it, unboxing and unveiling it. It's, it looks, it's gray. It's, it looks really nice. Yeah. Hmm. It is. I have sad, I have sad news, folks. What's that? I don't know how this happened, but the uh, Sony PlayStation 4 20th Anniversary Edition, brand new, factory sealed. Yeah. Sold on December 20 or December 6th, so two oh. days ago. Two days ago. Guess how much? I, I, oh my God! Figure that. Figure that a normal PlayStation Four sells or retails for about four hundred bucks. And that this did this sell for? They didn't tell how much this sold for. How much? No, you had to pre-order this. Yeah. What did it sell for? This one on eBay. Oh yeah, on eBay. What's it selling for? Fifteen thousand one hundred dollars. You'll probably get it too. No, it sold. It, it had a hundred and six oh. bidder. It had a hundred and six bidders. Oh my gosh! It had a hundred and six bidders, and it ended at fifteen thousand one hundred dollars. There you go. Nostalgia is a deadly tool. Evidently. Wow, fifteen thousand six. What do you think he paid for it? What What did it go? Went for four hundred. I didn't. I didn't check the the pre order. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Fifteen thousand. And, and they said that you know those some of them were listing for twenty grand. Wow. Um. But yeah, no, it's. Uh, they said that you know Sony announced last Wednesday, so I, I have, it appears that you had like between Wednesday and Sunday to pre-order it, and now you're, uh, you know, oh wait, here we go. Uh, as of, and uh, can make a top bid. Oh, so apparently they're raffling off the, you know, the 20th anniversary PS4s. Like Sony was raffling them off. Yeah. And apparently you could uh, put your bid in for about 1,500 bucks. To wow. Sony, wow! And they sold twelve thousand. So that's you know, that's a couple million dollars right in the bank. Yes. Yeah, and that's a couple million dollars for like 
not even that much software. Like they're selling these things, you know, six, seven, eight times the cost of parts. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, we should have bought. I, 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 no, I, I don't. I don't even want one. I never had a PlayStation. I've always been Xbox, Xbox. or Nintendo. Like it, it's never. So like I'm not even affected by this at all. But apparently some people, second. Well, if they come out with an Xbox anniversary edition, well, <laughs> that's what we can do. They come out with Halo with all the time, and I drool. I yeah. drool. Grayson Hamilton is going to be on tomorrow's show. It's our Gamer Tuesday show. Uh, tomorrow. That's right. Uh, our Gamer Tuesday show. It's always the second Tuesday of the month. And Grayson Hamilton, who is our ga Computer America Gamer correspondent, and also he's with Pop Zara now. He's one of the editors at Pop Zara magazine. Uh, he's uh, going to be uh, with us on both hours of the show. And we're going to be talking about 60 seconds. Well, it's December, so we're going to be talking about uh, the great holiday games that are available now. And, of course, what to expect in the upcoming uh, But uh, Grace is going to be for both hours. It's going to be a fun show, and hopefully we will see you there uh, on tomorrow night's program. Again, congratulations to all of our winners at our Logitech contest, and uh, also thanks to our, our guests uh, uh, for being here on the show tonight. Gamer Tuesday tomorrow night. If you're interested in games, this is the place to be. And... Uh, We'll see you here tomorrow night with some really cool games. Grayson Hamilton. So until tomorrow night, this is Craig Crossman hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night, everyone. Ten seconds. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. All right. Again, thanks, everybody, for watching our live uh, Computer America video streaming page. And, again, Gamer Tuesday tomorrow night. Hopefully we'll see you here. Good night, everybody. <laughs>